just get there myself, Colossians 1, and we're going to be down around verse number 24, we'll start right there this morning, and, and uh, let's see what we got here. Colossians chapter number 1, verse 24, he says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and uh, fill up the, that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ, and, and my flesh for his body's sake, which is his church, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given you, uh, to, me for you, uh, given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, now this is where we want to be, uh, even the mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Verse 27, and we talked about those mysteries last week. This week we need to talk about a particular mystery. He says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, um, of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so notice there, Christ in you, we're going to circle back to that, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This world is, um, um, if you're saved, this world does recognize one thing about you. There's something different about you. It's we, we, they talk, uh, they have all these movies about uh, possession, devil possession, and people being possessed with spirits, and uh, the reality of a Christian is that a Christian is possessed of the Holy Ghost, is possessed of the Lord Jesus Christ, is possessed of God, the Bible teaches that. And so what happens is, um, they, they, they almost seem like it's normal for people who are possessed of the devil or live worldly to be possessed of that spirit, but when they see somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, it's almost like, ooh, that's scary, that, what's wrong with that, there's something, why, why should that be an unusual thing? You're going to be possessed of something, even Ephesians chapter 2 speaks about us being quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, and it talks about the, the, uh, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. There was a spirit that worked in us. We we were possessed of something prior to knowing the Lord, and now we're possessed of something different. It shouldn't be a strange thing to this world. Listen, when they they are full of their their, their worldliness and their activity, they get, I mean, they they go uh, root hog or die. They're headlong into it. They start a business, they're, uh, everything in, in their life is about that business. They, uh, they, they go to a ball game, have a football team or a, 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 a golfer that they like or something weird like that, and they're eat up with it. They'll wear the t-shirts, the logo, and they think it's a weird thing that you walk down in Walmart and you got a shirt that says, Jesus saves sinners, or a, a verse on the back of that, or, or, or something recognizing that you love Jesus. I have a ball hat or something. I, I, I'm glad Mr. Edward was, uh, at the Sister Living yesterday has a little ball hat on about, about him loving God. And let me say something to you. You're going to be possessed of something. Why not be possessed of the Spirit of God? Why not? Why do, why do people have a problem with that? Uh, Ephesians chapter number 1 um, teaches us that we are a purchased possession. Look at this. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now this predestination here is not as Calvinists would suppose uh, they suppose that the uh, predestination here is God made plans that some would be saved and God made plans that someone would be lost. They go to Romans 9, Lord willing, one of these days we'll go to Romans 9 as we have been there before and explain those vessels on the honor and dishonor. But for now, we're right here with this uh, predestination. This is what God predestined. He predestined that 
anybody who would choose Jesus Christ would be saved and have the benefit. That's what he predestined. And anybody who would reject would suffer consequence. But listen, he didn't choose for you. You have a will. Where uh, Calvinists go wrong, strongly wrong, and you say, why is it on your mind? Because I've really been back and forth with a man we met on vacation, and, and I'm trying to get him to engage in a conversation. I'm not, I, I, I'm not a, I guess he assumes I'm a rough guy, and I'm not. I'm not a, I, I'm very patient, very gentle, very meek when it comes to trying to help people. Um, but we've been back and forth, but it's amazing how they ignore one thing that God has given, well, there's several things, actually, but one of the things is the will of man. Listen, man has a will so strong, look at Pharaoh, he rejects to the end. Right? It is such a strong will that we can reject. Paul, uh, the Holy Spirit nudging him uh, not to go up uh, to Jerusalem, not to go up, and he goes anyway, uh, resisting. Listen, he said to Paul, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now you can argue that, that Paul eventually threw in the towel, but listen, he didn't have to. He just realized, he had sense enough to realize that that is this God that's right here, he is, he's the true and living God, and I missed it. Let me say something to you. Why, if, if we couldn't resist God's will, why does the Bible say, if we be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are we bastards or not sons? Why is He chastising anybody? Whom the Lord loveth, He chases. Why is He chasing us? Because we did His will? We, he is chasing us because we kicked against Him. What is this business about uh, grieving the Holy Spirit if you can't resist His will? That's insane to say you can't resist His will. You most certainly uh, can. And the Bible says, For this cause many are sick and weakly among you, and many have fallen asleep. You most certainly can uh, resist His will. Another thing they miss is this. They miss the fact that you have a conscience and you have an, a measure of faith that God's given to all of us. All can believe. And so three things that really stand very strongly uh, in opposition to Calvinism is the fact that man has a will. God created us that way. I understand that. We have a choice. We can believe or not believe. That's the second thing. But we have a will. And then we have a conscience. He's put that conscience. You can sear the conscience. Uh, li listen, you can, listen, you, uh, the Bible talks about searing it with a hot iron. Some, some have put it, listen, you read about those that are reprobate. Those are those that have seared those conscience. They, they no longer have a conscience about the sin, but they knew the truth and they resisted it and they got to a point. I'm not the judge of where, who's at that point and not at that point. But what I want you to see is this predestination has to do with God devising an order after you get saved. It's not, does he know the beginning from the end? Yes. Does he set up what you're going to choose and what you're not going to choose? No. You choose what you want to choose. It's free will. Now listen, think about it. It's silly. It's silly to say whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's silly to say whosoever. You know how many times whosoever is mentioned over and over throughout the scriptures? Do you know how often a free will offering is mentioned even in the Old Testament? Think about it. Why would it be free will if you didn't have a will, if you didn't have a choice? It does not make any kind of sense. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So the predestination is God's plan. Notice verse 12, that we should be the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. That's the plan. You, can, you have right to this inheritance when you trust Him and when you believe. Look, verse 13, in whom also... Uh, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye did what? After you did what? See, God's predestination plan comes into effect after you believe, after you've trusted. It's not until after that 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 whole thing is set in order. You have no right to what he's fixing to say if, you're not, if you haven't believed and trusted him in whom ye, that ye believed and were sealed uh, with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of the inheritance, notice it's the down payment, until the redemption, notice this, of the purchased 
possession unto the praise of His glory. You are a purchased possession, and I want you to see the purchased possession is also going to be possessed of the purchaser. Purchaser. We're going to see that in just a minute. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He expects to be in control, but the reality of it is this. If, if God's plan and, and His will cannot be resisted, what are all these Christians doing? And, and listen, they may say, Calvinists may say, well, they're not even saved to begin with. That's a funny way to look at it uh, until you sin. Can we say that about you? You're not saved anyway because look how wickedly you turn your heart against God. See, it's always when it's somebody else, it's easy to look and say, man, they ain't saved, they ain't real, they ain't this, they ain't that. But when it's your turn, you expect people to believe you're still saved after the sins you committed. It's it's an absurd way to look at things. 1 Corinthians 6. Watch this. It says, verse 18, Flee uh, fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? Look, now watch. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is, we're going to see, we ain't there yet. It is where the Holy Ghost resides inside of here. And we're going to see that. Now, you're going to tell me, now I'll say this, I'm in favor of the fruits of salvation. You're going to tell me that a Holy Spirit comes inside of a person when they believe, that's when He does it, comes inside and there's not a change at all? Now listen, I think by the, fru- by their, the Scripture says, by their fruits ye shall know them. There are some ways God gives us to measure. But let me caution everybody, maybe listen, everybody here, listen, there's only one person that can truly know the heart. One person. You look at Lot, nobody would have ever said Lot is saved. Commit, listen, Listen, incest with his own daughters, drunkenness, uh, yoking up with a bunch of sodomites. You know, listen, you, you're gonna, listen, nobody would ever look and say, that man is right. But you know what God said? That righteous man, he vexed his righteous soul from day to day. That just man vexed his righteous soul from day to day and seeing and hearing their unlawful deeds. And so um, you would have never guessed it. Watch what it says here. What, know ye not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, uh, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Notice the purchased possession. Ye are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, listen, a lot of people have the outward, the body part, down. But you know what, the, 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 what I've learned over the years, the hard part is the second part of that, and in your spirit which are God's. God expects us not only to get control of the outside, He expects us to get control of the inside. The hard battle, if you you, as as a Christian, usually the first thing to go early on is the outward things, the drinking and the smoking and the uh, the cussing and uh, uh, whatever your outward is. Yours may be different. I don't know. The covetousness, the idolatry, I don't know what the outward is. But the inside... The inside, that pride and that, that conceited uh, nature about you where you think that the world revolves around you, that side is the hard nut to crack. That is the tough part of Christianity where we may get the outside like the Pharisees did. We may get it clean. We may get it in, uh, in confirmation with, with the Word of God. We may line it up with the book and then the inside as the Pharisees is full of dead men's bones. That inside is, is the tough part uh, of Christianity. It's the tough part to get under control. It's tough when somebody reviles for you not to revile back, but that starts on the inside. It's tough to pray for somebody. The Bible says pray for them who despitefully use you. That's not an easy thing to do. That's an inside problem where the inside rises up and says, I want to get back with them. The Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. It's not your job. But the inside says, I've got to get back. 
And listen, you've got to get, listen, it's not just the outside that needs to be under control. It's the inside. And that's the hard part of Christianity. Acts chapter number 8, let's look at this. Acts 8. Now listen, prior to, we talked about Ephesians 2. We talked about that outside, uh, or that control, that uh, spirit, the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. Acts chapter number 8, let's, let's just see where, now a lot, listen, listen to me. A lot of people look at these possessions in the Bible and they say, yeah, that guy's very bad off. That guy's very bad off because he's possessed of the devil. Uh, hold, your, hold your hand here in Acts 8. Let's just go to Ephesians. I want to read this to you and show you this. Lest when we read this, you say, man, them people are really bad off and Ah, man, I never get so bad I'm possessed of the devil. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in time past we walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now listen to me. A Calvinist does not believe that whosoever is whosoever. A Calvinist does not believe that all is all. But a Bible-believing Christian, when it says all, it means all. It's not that hard. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. That's Christian, non-Christian. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. Now watch what it says among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Notice, notice what it says in verse 1. The Spirit that now worketh where? Where does the Spirit work? There's a Spirit of disobedience which we've all had our conversation with in time past, all of us, not some of us, notice, it works in the children of disobedience. That is your vessels uh, uh, of dishonor that, that, that deserve wrath and deserve judgment, Romans chapter number 9. It's the children of disobedience. That's that vessel that he's molding. Notice it's of the same lump, Romans chapter number 9. And he's there molding that vessel fitted unto wrath. That vessel of wrath is the children of disobedience before we knew God. And that vessel of mercy is what he showed us after we trusted him and believed him. Listen, they're made of the same lump. Listen, the whole lump uh, is, is corrupt and he, he, has to, he has to mold us after we make our choice for Him. He molds us to what we need to be. Notice it says we all had our conversation in time past. Some of us wasn't born good and some of us born bad. All of us were born bad. All of us were born into sin. Man in his best state is altogether vanity. Uh, Psalm 39.5 At his best state. We all were born that way. We all were possessed of the spirit of disobedience. Now we might not have been possessed as some of these were and it began to affect things in their life. Look at Acts 8 now. But listen, we were all possessed of the spirit of disobedience. No doubt, the scripture says. Romans, uh, Acts chapter number uh, 8, look what it says here in verse number 7. Uh, 6, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles that which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Notice many possessed, and that's, listen, that, that devil, he, listen, he came to kill, steal, and destroy. You look at those evil spirits that, that work for him. I don't like calling them demons, that's a Greek word. I call them uh, devils like the Bible calls it. That's a Greek mythology word, that demon. And so I try to leave that along. I know what it means when people say it, I'm not... But it's not in the, it's in the new Bibles. 
Your new Bibles will have that. Where did we get that term? It's from Greek mythology. That's why I stay away from it. The Bible calls them devils. I understand the concept, and people say demons. They, they're meaning devils when they say it. I don't go around trying to correct everybody, but I want the church to know that the Scripture says devils on purpose, and I shy away from something that's associated with a false religion, which is Greek mythology. But notice this. Um, let's go to... Um, First, uh, Acts chapter number 16. Acts 16. Acts 16. Look at verse number 16. Acts 16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her master much gain and soothsay. And so we can see just the illustration. There's so many other illustrations we can go to. We see a man who brings his son. He, he's possessed and that devil is casting him into the fire. That's the way the devil is. He's, he's self, he likes to cause self-destruction. When you see all this cutting and all this uh, suicide and listen, uh, uh, those pigs ran down the mountain, killed themselves when they were full of those devils. We see that man there in a tomb cutting himself. You know what all that stuff is associated with? It's associated with devil possession. It's associated with devils. Okay? And listen, you see people. Listen, the, the maniac of Gadara, he's a good testimony to us that people can be freed from that lifestyle. A lot of people write people like that off. I don't. I don't. I'd rather have somebody who's scarred up and down their arms and, and, and of a, over a foolish life and, and gets right with God and loves Him than somebody who sits in church and pretends like they're okay the rest of their life and goes to hell. I'll take those uh, that are scarred and messed up and, and need a little healing because, you know why? Because that was me and that is still me. That's where the uh, Lord brought me from. He brought me from the, uh, a miry pit and He set my feet upon a rock and established my going. He put a new song in my heart, even praise the Lord, hallelujah, how can you say anything but that? Right? Listen, he changed my life. And listen, uh, 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 um, anybody who gets up and pretends like that, that there is a, a crowd that's substandard, there's something wrong with you, there's something wrong with your heart, you don't have any love for people, and you need to shut your mouth and go and find a preacher who will preach to you about your heart being right, and you need to get your heart right because you don't care for people. You ought not be teaching or preaching to anybody till you have a love and care for people because this thing is about changed lives. It's about changed lives. Listen, the Bible says in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything or uncircumcision, but a new creature. A change is what he's looking for. He's looking for hearts to change. Now you think about that. You think about that old maniac of Gadara. How many people didn't like him? How many people were nervous around him after he got right? They were more scared of him after he got right than, <laughs> than they were when, when he was all in the tomb crying and cut himself. Here they are trying to chain him and trying to do all this other stuff. And here he is clothed in his right mind. He's found peace. He's found happiness. He's found contentment. And listen, I'm telling you, whenever people find peace and happiness and contentment, there'll all be, always be somebody there, always be somebody there to criticize. Always. And what I've learned over the years is that you know, over in Nehemiah chapter number uh, 6, Sanballat and all them came and are trying to get them to come down from the great work, Nehemiah, and, and, they, and they thought to do him mischief. And you know what he said? I can't come down. I have a great work to do, and I can't come down. Listen to me. Learn that the critics want you to cease from your labors and your work. It's best just to absolutely ignore them and let them know, I don't have time to waste with you. There's too many people who need me to finish this work. God's given us a great work to do. And people are going to be critical of the work. Let them be critical. Just keep doing the work. That's all you can do. Keep doing the work. Don't worry about what people think. Romans chapter number 6. 
Romans 6. We see this change in change in leadership in our lives. The Bible says in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom you obey, uh, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants, you were the servants of sin. Note, see that? You're controlled by that sin. You were those servants. You were possessed of that old life and that old spirit. It, but, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being made free from sin, that you may be the servants of righteousness. We are under different ownership. We are possessed of something that's different. Now in the text, this is what I want to get to right here. This is what I was leading to. There's been a change in membership. There's been a change in leadership. Let me say that. Um in control of our lives. And I want you to see this, that our text says Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? Who's in you? Christ is in you. Now, I want to point out to, to the, uh, the, we call it the Trinity. The Trinity ain't in the Bible. Well, the rapture's not in the Bible. There's a lot of things ain't in the Bible. We have a word describing it. If you want to say the three in one, that's fine. I'm good with that. I'm not going to sit. People argue over things that are so petty. Um, and, and that's a stupid argument anyway. The, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, so it can't exist. This is what I want you to see. There's a number of things that manifest that there's three in one. Listen, we couldn't even... I, listen, I got pages and pages of notes at home trying to cover this three in one thing and the Trinity over the years, and I've studied this thing very well, but one of the things I want you to see that manifests the Trinity, the Bible says that Christ in you, then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit's in you, and then the Bible says that God is in you. Now, you're either possessed of three, or they're the same. I'm telling you, the Bible, the way it describes it, they're all three the same. Let me show you. Christ in you. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans 8. Romans 8. So, if I were to take that to be true, Christ in you, the hope of glory, if Christ is not in you, you got no hope. It's the hope of glory. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, that we had no hope when we were out in Christ. Look at this. Romans chapter number 8. Look at verse 6. He says, For to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, now watch, but in the Spirit, if so be that, watch, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Do you see that? Now watch. Now if any man have not the what? <laughs> That's God's Spirit. It's Christ's Spirit. So I think it's pretty evident that God and Christ are the same. That's not very hard to see. He is none of His. Now who's in you? Who's in you? The Spirit of God? The Spirit of Christ? That's what it calls Him. Watch. Verse 10, And if... Oh, really? Christ in you, the hope of glory? Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. Do you see that? Notice verse 11 again. But if the Spirit that raised up Christ, uh, Jesus from the dead, does what? Dwell in you. The Spirit that raised Him dwells in you. Christ uh, dwells in you. We're going to see in a minute. God dwells in you. This isn't the only passage. There's many of them. So I, want you, I want you to see that Christ in you, the hope of glory... 
Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Spirit of God in you. God is dwelling in you in the body. You're the uh, temple of the Holy Ghost. He's dwelling in there. So my, 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 my issue is this with a lot of professing Christians. You're going to tell... Now listen, I, 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 I know that He deals with us and we resist His will. But you're going to tell me the Spirit of God is going to come in to uh, our body and there's not going to be a change. I'm sorry, you're going to think differently, you're going to act differently, you're going to start digging, trying to find uh, that sincere milk of the Word, and you're going to find verses and go, I didn't know that was wrong, I didn't know that was wrong. Man, I need to fix that, I need to fix this. Man, I need to start doing this, I need to stop doing this, I need to keep doing this. We have a little thing at work, start, stop, and continue. Some things you need to start doing, some things you need to stop doing, some things you need to continue doing because they're right. And that's the way a Christian's life is. Start, stop, and continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. It says this, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of who? Okay, so it said you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now it said you're the temple of God. Are they not the same? They are the same. Look at this. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that, uh, and that the Spirit of God dwell in you? If any man defile the temple of God... Him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That's pretty, pretty evident, isn't it? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, just a couple chapters to the right. We uh, read this a little earlier. I want to emphasize this. It says, that your, uh, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? So those two go together, and that's why I want to emphasize that. So go to chapter 14. Chapter 14. Chapter 14. It shows you these Corinthians had a problem with the Trinity themselves. Did, Corinthians was a carnal church. They had a lot of doctrinal issues that were wrong, a lot, of, a lot of fleshy things going on. Paul is constantly trying to correct them. Isn't it amazing how much doctrine he covers with the Corinthian church? Boy, he wrote them a, a, a long letters. <laughs> I, and listen, a, a lot of their issue was for, around idolatry and fornication. A lot of there is, you read, he's constantly, listen, listen, you think about it, chapter number, chapter number, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 7, you know what he deals with them, each chapter? Fornication. At 1 Corinthians 6, you're, uh, uh, he's telling them, look here, uh, any man that commits uh, fornication sinneth against his own body, uh, chapter 5, before that, I, it's reported commonly there's fornication among you, and fornication it shouldn't even be named among the Gentiles. One should have his father's wife. And then he goes to chapter number 7 and says this. He says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. they got a lot of problems, a lot of doctrinal issues, and he, he takes great lengths to labor to try to correct it. Watch what it says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 25. He says, And thus are the secrets of the heart made manifest, so falling down uh, uh, upon His face, He will worship God and report that God is where? In you of a truth. God in you, Holy Spirit in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Listen, uh, listen, you can argue all day long But the Bible says that they're all the same. They're the same. Listen, they they have different functions. No doubt. Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send this Holy Spirit when I go away, a comforter, to help you. He's going to guide you in all truth. And then He's the Word made flesh dwelling among us. And He's, listen, the Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, how can you see it any other way? Listen to me, listen to me. 
There's only one that Jesus makes clear is worthy of worship. There's only one. Worship God. He said, the, the, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. That's what Jesus said, right? You know what God allowed people to do? Many times, you, or Jesus allowed people to do? Many times. It says they fell down at His feet and worshipped Him. He didn't say get up. He let them. Now you got a problem if He ain't God. You got a problem. Listen, he was God manifest in the flesh, so there's no issue with it. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. We see it again, 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, verse number 14. He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. Now notice, as God hath said. I got a whole list of Old Testament prophecies where God said exactly what's written here. Exodus 29, 45, Leviticus 26, 12, Jeremiah 31, uh, 33, 32, 38, Ezekiel 11, 20, Ezekiel 36, 28, uh, 37, 26, and Zechariah 8, 8, Zechariah 13, 9. Is that enough? Watch. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will dwell in them and walk in them. Who's speaking here? God. God is speaking, and listen, the reference here is Old Testament. Well, I, don't know. I think you should just do away with the Old Testament. Paul the Apostle didn't think so. He quotes it right there. Well, that's under the law. Okay, he just gave you verses under the law. What are you going to do with that? When Paul wanted to teach something, he went Old Testament. You deal with it. I don't like the Old It don't matter. Listen, you see all those New Testament authors quoting that Old Testament. Now, you've got to use it right in its context. But notice, notice this. He says, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. So you got Christ in you, you got the Holy Spirit in you, and you got God in you. The Bible teaches. Turn to uh, chapter 13, same book, chapter 13, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 13. Paul says this in verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses er, shall every word be established. I told you before uh, and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now I write unto you which here, heretofore uh, uh, to them heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again I will not spare since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me uh, which to you word is not weak but is mighty in you. Uh, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God, for we, are all, uh, we also are uh, weak in him, but uh, we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Notice what he says, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Uh, know ye not, uh, your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Listen, the theme over and over hasn't changed. God in you, Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you, they are the same. You can argue all day long, but there's a whole mountain of scriptures that says you're wrong. 
Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. And this right here pretty much will sum it up. You can't get around it. Show me the wiggle, wiggle room in Ephesians chapter number 4. There's no wiggle room here. Isaiah 43, 44, 45, 46. You know what he says? I am the Lord God. There is none other. None other. No other. Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called with all lowliness and meekness and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, even as there is one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. No, there's two gods. There's three gods. It says there's one God. Christ in you. The Holy Spirit in you. uh, The Father in you. It's one God. It's not multiple gods. Look at this. One God and Father of all who is above all and through you all. And what? You know what the Bible made very clear there? Isn't that a blessing? That the Father's in you. Isn't that something? You got the Father, you got the Son, and you got the Holy Ghost. Same people dwelling in you. It's listen, there's not three people in me. I hope not. Might explain the personality changes with some people. <laughs> They get to where they don't like the preaching. I don't know. All three of them will whip you hide. I think, I, you know, you look at people the way they change sometimes. They get all upset and you're like, I'm just reading the Word of God. I'm thinking the devil has a trinity in them working sometimes. First John 4, we'll close right here for the morning. First John 4. First John 4. 1 John 4. The Bible says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come uh, in the flesh is not of God. Uh, And... This is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Look at verse number 4. Love this verse. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Listen. Because greater is He. Who's the He? Verse 2. The Spirit of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. Listen, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience when the spirit of God comes inside of you. Now let me say something to you. One of the greatest manifestations and greatest uh, downsides of this Calvinistic argument is that Paul writes to Christians who have sinned and tells them to repent. Because if you can't resist His will, what are they doing resisting His will? You say, they'll eventually get it right. Not all of them. Not all of them. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Not all of them. What is this weak and sickly and and many have fallen asleep? What is that? You can resist His will. You can resist His grace. You can. How about about Stephen when he's preaching in Acts chapter number 7? You stiff neck 
and uncircumcised in heart, you do always do what? Resist the Holy Ghost. We can resist. Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Ghost. You reckon they resisted His will? And they wound up dead. You can't say you can't resist God's will. We do it all the time. Anybody who says we can't resist His grace or His will or any of that, you're not living in reality. You're lying about the sins you commit on a daily basis resisting His will. That's insane. Anyway, Christ in you. The hope of glory. Amen. Let's take a break.